Medals Week, and I am so pleased that we have the slate of instructors we have. The studio assistants are absolutely amazing, as you'll see by the slides tonight. Slides. As you see by the images tonight, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm really proud to be here and to be part of this and to um, introduce to you first, uh, Corin Herson. Corin is our medals tech for the summer. He's here all summer. He is from uh, Windsor, California, in Sonoma Valley. He graduated from San Diego State with a BA in metals. He is currently at Texas Tech earning his MFA in metals, jewelry making and metal smithing. And he hopes to continue making art and to be a jewelry professor. So who could be in a much better place than this? Huh? Uh, he's absolutely been wonderful and I, he's made all of our summers easier even though you guys may not know it yet. So um, he has. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I've got, only got about five slides uh, to show you tonight, um, starting with some of my earlier work. Um, this is a locket that I have uh, did uh, many years ago. This one is uh, titled A Place to Put the End. It's uh, a shelf. It's all uh, slotted together so there's no solder and I'll use on this. Uh, it's a little over a foot across in the back. container. It's uh, copper and enamel and uh, most of it is uh, die cast and then sawing and piercing. Look at that gorgeous. Corin, what are the materials have inside? Like that's enamel inside there? Yes, it's a stone, stone back enamel. And this is a series of my, some of my more recent work. I call these the uh, tree pins. And this is uh, relating back to uh, where I grew up and kind of talking about the uh, orchards and the death of the orchards in Snow County. What, what's the material on the, the right? I mean, how is that done? It's all copper and brass. Are they riveted? Yes. These are uh, preformed and shaped rivets. You have apples on sides and uh, mm -hmm. apple blossoms on the top and bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then this is the, the most recent piece I've completed, and it's called Working Out the Kinks. Is that all metal? Yes, everything is uh, metal in this. The inside, the mouth is formed by Jason Repuse. So if you're taking uh, Nancy's class. The zipper? The zipper is handmade. It's out of brass. Wow. And this is uh, another shot of it. And it's oh, wow. Yeah. Where is it? It's so cool. And this one is uh, relating to relationships and communication how we kind of, what secrets we hide and kind of what secrets we share and when we share them. So thank you for letting me share my work with you. Um, next up I would like to introduce Leanne Van De Venter. Uh, she hails from Central California and she's a graduate of Cal State Long Beach. And she's joining us on a short respite from traveling and enjoying art. And she's our studio coordinator, so please give her a hand. Cal State Long Beach with a degree in printmaking and a degree in math. And 
This is one of my silkscreen prints. This is another one of my prints. This is a monotype and an etching. Oh, with oil etching ink. That's not an etching. <laughs> That's just a monotype. This I made in my enameling class, and it is a um, copper bowl that's pierced with enamel. Cool. This I made after I graduated. I went to Long Beach City College and took a class, and that is copper with um, some of my silkscreen prints and their resin set. And this is one of my pieces that I used in my VIP show, and it is a copper plate that I used to make a print with, and then I cut it up and made it into a necklace and enameled it. What's inside? It's three sheets of enamel, so, or not enamel, copper. So the back one is the green, and it's um, concave, and then there's a center sheet that's just flat, that's pierced, and then the front sheet is convex, and it is pierced. And this I made in my enameling class, and it is one of my printmaking plates that I filled with um, enamel, and then well, I cut it out first and then filled it with enamel and made it into a necklace. And next, I'm going to introduce Jamie Kunkel. She is the student assistant for Deaf Jumont this, this uh, week. And she started out doing wire wrapping while she was going to grad school just as a hobby. And then about three years ago, she started taking that a little more seriously. And she said once she learned how to solder, there was no stopping her. <laughs> and her favorite part about metals is the fire and the heat and melting and uh, soldering, for sure. And in the future, she would like to continue making jewelry and um, eventually make this part of her career. some um, just fused argentium earrings. Uh, this was actually the first pair I made when I learned you could fuse argentium, um, which was really exciting. And after that, I spent a lot of time fusing. And so most of my recent work has involved a lot of fusing because it means more fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is another piece I did this year. Um, it's a uh, thick band that was roller printed. And then it's a cone shaped piece of metal that's holding that garnet there. Um, so it's very solid and heavy feeling, which I really like, and also it keeps me from being able to accidentally break the garnet because it's well protected. <laughs> um, I came out of uh, engineering, and I really love um, anything that has to do with, you know, connectors and fasteners and things that come from my old life, from the laboratory, from just putting together a pressure vessel, anything like that. And so screws and nuts are commonly featured in my work. Um, this is tension setting. Um, I've been playing around with tension. I think it's a, a fun thing to do to get the metal to be hard enough to hold something in. Um, and uh, so that's a tension set smoky quartz. And then these last two pieces I wanted to show you because um, for the last year I've been tutoring. And I work one-on-one -on -one with high school students and one of the really cool things about it is they really inspire me. Um, and so the two pieces were both made for my students um, because of something they said or something they did. And I personally don't really like hearts very much, but I had a student, she really loved to wear hearts, and she was one of the most wonderful people I've ever known. And I had to make her something, so <laughs> I made her that top piece. And then the bottom piece was um, for a student who is a very bright, high-performing female who had this secret 
belief that she had somehow tricked everyone in her life into believing that she was far more competent than she actually was. <laughs> um, and for those of you who know of this, it's actually, there's a name for it, it's called imposter syndrome. So that's my imposter oh. necklace. And you'll see in about the dead center there, there's a brass tube um, that is the imposter that is somehow snuck into this sterile yeah. necklace. <laughs> so next up is Deb Jamar. And I'm going to introduce her. Uh, she took her first medals class in 1975. She tells me she was two then, for those of you who are doing that. <laughs> and she's been doing medals for 37 years. <laughs> she says she still loves it just as much as when she started because it's hard and because you have to fight it and because she likes to be the boss of the medal. <laughs> Um, she loves teaching, but this summer she's actually looking forward to spending some time uh, working on, well, working in her studio first and foremost, and secondly, and um, the thing you should all pressure her about is working on her soldering book. And she's been talking about the soldering book for a while, so if you guys want to bother her the next time you see her about it, <laughs> and I'm going to get myself in trouble here, you totally should. <laughs> I understand that. So these first images are all digitized from really terrible slides, okay? Um, what I did was that I went back through a history of my work, and since it started in 75, I have a long history of work. Not that I'm good about taking slides, but I have a lot of them, um, or taking pictures. Um, and what I decided to do in this one is uh, especially since so many of you know me already and you know kind of what I do nowadays and that kind of thing, I thought that I would um, do a history of my work using the spoon and serving spoon image and when it started and how I've loved that all through the years and how I've used it through the years. So this is the first one that I found. I don't think it's the first one I made, but it's the first one I found an image of. Uh, this was made in 1977, and it's a, we, the assignment was to sink a bowl. Uh, that bowl is about four inches across. That is a longhorn horn. Um, this is called Homage to Texas, and it opens up and has all kinds of Texas things inside it. I was at school at University of Houston studying under Val Link and Sandy Zilker. Um, the spur does turn. Um, it's got the Texas stars. It's, there you go. That's Texas. Uh, in 78, this is 1978, I was between uh, University of Houston. I'd gotten my BFA in jewelry making and metalsmithing. And I came out to California to establish residency because I didn't want to pay out of state tuition to go to graduate school. So I was, it was the year between undergraduate and graduate school, and I, I was doing drafting to make a living, which is something I'd done all through high school, and, and I knew how to do, and I was pretty good at, but I wasn't about to give up metal. So what I did was to start trying to think up something I wanted to do that would sell, that would make a living, or at least something. And I thought baby spoons was going to be it. It is. But <laughs> I really love doing them. So this is a series of baby spoons that I did. And they did end up in the, do you guys, anybody remember the Goodfellow catalog of wonderful things? Yeah. yeah, these were in there. The one on the far left is a teething ring. It's, um, it's the plastic, it has little plastic bits in it. So you can, it shakes a little bit. And it's good for teething. They're all sterling silver. Um, the one on the right, far right upper one has pearls. Um, it's just a series of baby spoons. This is now, okay, we skipped a long time now. So this is in 1993. It's after graduate school and after all three kids of, of mine were born. <laughs> so we skipped a lot of years there, but there was a lot going on in my life. I, I started doing the Rosen shows, the ones, I think they're called Buyer's Market of America now. 
They're in Philadelphia. I would travel with all my stuff to either Philadelphia or to Boston. I do these huge trade shows that's wholesale only. Um, and I put these things out there. This is salad servers. They're stainless steel. I made them by the bazillions. Um, and they were fun. I always called <laughs> I always called them my boy and my girl. The boy had hair and the girl didn't have any or I don't know. But anyway, this, that's my salad servers. Uh, this is 94, so I upped, because the salad servers actually, and I had a lot of other utensils, but they did really well. These were made out of nickel silver and they were rhodium plated. Um, they're the zigzag salad servers. Gil, my husband, some of you know he makes jewelry tools and whatnot. He made the jig for me to bend those so that I could bend them really fast. Um, and the spoon and the fork are made out of belt buckle blanks. Yeah, and all you have to do is just cut the little holes in the fork and you're done with them. Uh, works really, really well. I decided I was tired of making inexpensive ones. I wanted to sell fewer, more expensive things. Problem is nobody bought them, but that's okay. Uh, these are also made out of buckled blanks, but these are all sterling silver. And they have citrines in the handle. And they are indeed as heavy as they look, and they're so graceful. The middle one is a little cheese knife. And this is 95, and I, I love making these things. I still make these things. Okay. 95, still. This is a Denny Toss spoon set. I also had hors d'oeuvre forks that had the same things. I had a lot of different handles and a lot of different things. Um, but they were so much fun, and they actually did sell really well, and I enjoyed them. I had a series that I made in nickel and a series I made in sterling. This is that I finally found a better clientele. This was a custom baby spoon I did for somebody. Hand forged sterling silver, um, and I loved it. Very nice, very fun. We skipped one. We'll get to it at the end. I realized later that it was in a different format. This one is, so there's an image we'll come back to that's in between that one and this one. This one is 2009, and it's after my last child was almost through college. So you can look at this and you can see that it's much more playful. It's much more um, just kind of for fun. I had some forging in there, some corrugation. Uh, Gil had built the corrugator by then, and so I was able to play with that. Um, it's, it's still a very functional spoon. Function has always been important to me because I use these spoons. So I want the bowls to be stainless so that I can use them and do things with them, but I want the handles to be fun. Um, much more experimental. Um, this one went to the auction in Yuma. So at this point, I pretty much decided to give up on trying to sell these. Um, because, well, this is Ripple's um, spoon, and it is formed copper, and again, a stainless steel bowl. Uh, this one was a juror's choice selection in the Charles Luton Brain competition, the fold forming competition. Um, and it's a really fun one. And it, even though it doesn't look like it, it's actually very easy to use. And it's, it's a really simple spoon. Um, so, but you can see how these are progressing. And now you'll really see. So this one is a very large spoon. It's roller printed, has silver. I'm beginning to really learn well how to wedge the, the stainless, deal with the stainless and the copper together along with the sterling. These are large, they are heavy, uh, they're very functional, even though they're large and heavy. When I'm getting to making these, what happens is I decide that I'm going to try to make them um, more quickly so that they'll have a, a good price point and everything else, and then I get them done and I look at them and go, Oh, I want to keep this one. <laughs> oh, I want to keep that one too. And I pretty much keep them all. <laughs> yeah. This is one of the later ones I have a picture of. I can't tell you that I don't take slides often at all. Uh, this one is corrugated, sterling silver, two garnet, stainless steel. Um, this one was, uh, was where I, I, I learned another way to kind of put them together that... Um, 
has transitioned into me being able to do more things with the stainless utensils that I have really, really enjoyed. So this is the latest one I have a slide of. There is the last one. Oh, no. My other one went away. Okay, on, good. On that one, uh, where you, is that garnet at the very end? There? There's a garnet at the very, both very ends. See, but there's one up at the top, and there's one, the little itty bitty one down that hangs down. And that's silver coming down? Yes, it is. And how did you attach, is that stay bright or is that solder? That's not solder. Yeah, it is. It's you mean the arm that comes down onto the stainless? Yeah. It doesn't even touch. Okay, but the stain, the stainless and the, the silver. Don't touch. It's suspended. Yeah. Okay, so that's what's next. All right, next I will be introducing Elise Price. She has been doing medals for a very long time. She told me probably since she was born, she said, <laughs> crawling around playing with metal. And, um, she actually really fell in love with metals when she did an apprenticeship to a blacksmith, and she um, didn't want to stop after that. And in the future, she says she's been doing metals for a long time, and she will continue to do metals for a long time. Elise. So say that I love chocolate. one view of it, and this is another view. This is about um, 40 inches tall, so about over three feet tall. Um, it's about, it's uh, 16 gauge copper, and it's been um, fold formed, burned through, and it's been enameled. So it's glass fused um, on metal, for those of you who don't know about enamel. And it's really fun. Um, this is another um, pretty large piece. Um, the base is just uh, steel, and I think it's a little thicker than a quarter inch, but it's not quite half inch uh, square stock that was formed. Because I really like the idea of drawing in space and taking something that sometimes is two dimensional and making it so that we can walk all the way around. So that's why I'm showing you different views so you can see different angle. Um, and I treat the metal like, you know, I now have learned how to treat the jewelry. So with a, a really a lot of care. And um, this is a close-up on the um, enamel piece, which is again 16 gauge copper. And I always start with flat copper, clean, perfect, and every single mark you see on that metal, I make. So those are not car parked, okay? Because that's <laughs> often what I saw. Car parked? You spray paint those? No, I actually put on a fire suit and I put them in a really hot kiln. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to work um, at Cal State Long Beach where I can work with ceramic. Uh, artists that allow me to use their um, walking kiln so, so I can fire. What's the gauge on the um, wire? So the wire, I, it's between a quarter inch and a half inch, but I don't remember exactly the um, dimension. Big. Big. And um, so it's all forged. And um, you, I'm a little frustrated with slide always like this, but um, all the, um, on the copper, I kind of mimic the gestural quality of the stand um, doing some sprechito in the enamel. Mm -hmm. And the, all those pieces are not, um, this is not hot connected, this is cold connected. So gravity mm -hmm. is just doing the work. Because that's really amazing that you can have a piece that is just standing with gravity. How big um, is that? That's about, um, 
that comes up to me, the stand comes up to me, and the enamel piece is about this big. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy working on the one-to-one -one relationship with the work. I think it's just like, it's just physically engaging. Mm -hmm. um, but I also realize that if I want to uh, get into show or maybe sell more work, uh, I have to do wearable pieces. So you can see the front and the back piece here. Mm -hmm. So it's all form, textured, burned through, and uh, enamel and mounted on a brooch. And that's about two and a half inch um, across. And is, did you do any electroforming on this? Or that's not electroform. That's all torch fired and um, melted and, and I grab the melting as it happens. So I get all those protruding, mm -hmm. protruding you know, texture. Um, and it's really fun. And this piece is um, traveling to Kentucky. It's going to the uh, Enamelist Conference in August. Mm -hmm. And if you guys are really into enameling, you should go because it's fantastic. And it is my great pleasure to introduce mm -hmm. Betty Ellen Longy. I want to do really justice to my introduction, so I asked her, how should I introduce you? And she said, well, you should just tell them that you know this really amazing person. <laughs> and so I was going to say that, and, and then she said, no, 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 it's a joke. You can just tell them um, you know, that I've been doing um, form, shell forming for a very long time. Uh, and that I studied, or I learned that with Edi Seba, who was uh, her mentor, and um, she just enjoyed it very much, and she's very happy to be here. But I don't think I need to say that. I think I really want to say that she's just an amazing woman. <laughs> Instead, it would be fun to, since the workshop I'm having <coughs> now is on spiculums, that I would s just show you the different spiculums that are the basic spiculums and then what you, what you can do with them or what I've done with them. So this is this, the most direct, simple spiculum. For those that aren't, you don't, who don't understand, the work <coughs> I do is shelf forming. It's a way of forming sheet metal using hammers. So everything that you see started out as a flat piece of sheet. And a spiculum is basically a, a, a tapered tube. It was developed by Hakey Seppa initially. And so you start with like a, a wedge-shaped sheet of metal that's absolutely straight, and uh, you turn it into a tube, and then you can bend it and do certain different things with it. So this is a very basic form. This would be the initial, very simple um, tapered tube. And then these are some of the pieces I did I really loved, when I first started making spiculums, I just really went wild with all kinds of um, ways of making them independents and objects. And I really loved the jade tusk shell. That's, a, that's what that green thing is, it's jade tusk shell. And uh, I like the way they went with the whole concept. And so then here's another spiculum. This one is one that Peggy made, actually, and this is a photograph of it. And uh, this is a spiculum that's tapered at both ends and is um, thicker in the center than, and then goes out. And it makes a, a beautiful one for making a, a, like a necklace and so forth like that. But it also can make a lot of, a lot of other things. So there's one. This is a dual function piece. It's both a necklace and a, st a sculpture, which is something that I was really interested in working with. And then the, it's titanium is the color in it that's in the two ends. So, so basically, if you can see, there's two joints. One's kind of halfway up on, on the, this, the second bar in on the left, and then there's another one down in the bottom. And what happened was those two, I think I have to do this this way. OK. The necklace is this piece here and this piece here. And when you take those two off the big swirl in the middle, you throw them together in the back, and you have a necklace. Wow. So I really like the idea of playing with the metal in that way and um, letting it, um, you have a, a wearable necklace, but when you're not wearing it, you have a sculpture, and it doesn't look like a necklace anymore. I did a whole series of pieces like that. I thought it was a lot of fun. 
Okay, so here's another one. We, this is the one we've been working on today. This is a flared spiculum. So you have a one end, a flare on it, and then, the other, and then it tapers down to the other end. It's a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so these are pieces that were made with that flared spiculum concept. This is again with the jade tusk shells. And here's another one using the flare, but on a much more restrained way. It just This one's a spiculum that's narrow in the middle and then flares out on each end. This was called party time. <laughs> I really like to work with ni niobium, too, and I like to relate niobium to colored uh, pearls because they're both made by, the, uh, the color is made by the same thing. Niobium, the color is not pigment. It's basically the same thing as oil on water. They're called interference colors or beetles. And pe pearls have that same color effect, and so, so it's fun to play the pearls against the niobium. There's another one that, this was another one of the dual function pieces. The, the, the piece at the end is a, a, a stalactite slice, amethyst stalactite slice, and the pin, it's a brooch, and, and the pin stem goes down the, 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 the spiculum, and then uh, you, you can pull it off and wear it as a pin, or you can put it on the stand, which was way more work than the brooch, <laughs> and wear it, in, but then you have it as a sculpture. And then these were the ones that really were really very, very important pieces in my life. I started playing around with the concept that the spiculum didn't have to just be closed into a tapered tube. It could be, you could, by in combining different forming processes, you could make it into a vessel, and these pieces were, they were made um, as talismans for healing, because I was going through a difficult time in my life at that point, and I thought about the fact of what was comforting, and I, one of the things I learned was that grieving was comfortable, was comfortable and was healing, so these were called vessels for tears, with the concept being that if you cry, you, you released all the pain of the grieving, and in these cases, since these vessels couldn't contain water, it was symbolic of the release you would have mm -hmm. when you were crying. Mm -hmm. So I made a whole series of those and continued to make them from time to time. This one is made out of bimetal, with the, so it's 18 karat gold on the inside, and then uh, the outside of it's silver, but, and then I, again I've trimmed it with the bimetal on the surface. another one of that series. And then I started making them and putting them on vases uh, so that they could be displayed when they weren't being worn. And this is another one that's made by, a, this is what's called a synplastic spiculum. So it's made differently and it's the, the form of the metal is put in before you close it into a spiculum. And this one is um, an example, again, of the dual function pieces. The center part of that comes off and becomes the, the, the front part of a necklace. But you can see the spiculum forms used to, using that synclastic spiculum uh, way of working. And that's it. Thank you. Next up, we have April Audi. She got her master's degree or MFA in photo, and after she graduated, she decided to do metals. And so she um, took classes and taught herself to do metals, and she's been doing that for the last 15 years. And within the last five years, she's been teaching high school kids um, metal smithing. She loves um, metals because it's receptacle for all the things that she has. So she makes things out of all of her stuff. And um, in the future, she would, well actually in the very near future, she just quit her job and decided that she would do jewelry full time. So hopefully that is successful for her. Okay. April? Montana and I spent a lot of time outdoors and on my parents farm and in the woods and one of my favorite places to go was this old dump where all the man-made things sort of rusted into 
nature. And I think that's really influenced both my photography and now my jewelry. And I have been doing jewelry for 15 years, but very part-time because I've been a mother and a teacher and all those other things. So I feel like I'm progressing a little bit and I'm very excited at this next step in my life where I'm really, that's kind of jumping up in the list of priorities. So it's pretty exciting for me. So I'll show you a few of my newer pieces. So I use a lot of beach stones. Um, I do use lots of texture in my work because I really like that feel of a relic or something that's sort of deteriorated along the way. Um, I've just started hammering and trying to figure that out and forging and so this is a bracelet that I made recently. I usually etch them first and then start hammering and see what happens. Um, these are some rings that I've done. Inspired when I was at uh, Metals Week a few years ago and saw Joanna Goldberg's <coughs> prong setting, definitely inspired by that. Uh, this bracelet was etched and formed. Um, my heart shaped box, heart shaped rock. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Connie Fox, which I think is kind of funny since most of you have either <coughs> taken a class from Connie Fox or taken a class with Connie Fox over the years, probably. <laughs> and now I have the pleasure of being her assistant and in a day have just had a great time and just realized uh, what a wonderful teacher she is. But um, she uh, actually went to college in social work and didn't take an art class in college at all. And after she finished um, uh, school, she uh, started doing flat loom weaving for quite a few years, and that kind of led her into the path that she is now in being creative and, um, work, and then working in metals. Um, one thing that I asked her when I asked her why she chose metal, and she said really it's about the design and that she really loves the design aspect of it. And, um, so I'm going to let her show you how that design has uh, led her to where she is. Thank you, Angel. Um, let's see. Oh, wrong one. Hmm. <laughs> well, Actually, this is the wrong photo from what I'm going to say, so we'll just kind of have to mix things up. But in 1996, um, I was seeing 100 domestic violence offenders per week in groups. They were all men, and I was the only woman sitting in the group. And um, it was very rewarding work for me, um, and it was also very stressful. And I felt like I really needed an outlet. And so I started with wire work, which this is not particularly. <laughs> this is later. Um, so I took classes with Lynn Merchant for some kind of outlet for the stress. And I often would be sitting at home on the phone talking to one of my clients and bending wire and saying, you did what? You know, kind of, come on, you can't do that. You know, trying to keep guys out of jail and not hitting their wives anymore. So, um, we'll just go on. This, actually, that you're looking at, um, I did last year, anti-plastic cuff with a hollow form. Um, and one of the, the projects that we're going to be working on this week. Wow. This looks really straight. Does it look strange to you? <laughs> We're looking at it straight on. Okay, it's good. Fine. It looks really it weird. Looks nice um, so this is another anti-plastic cuff um, with enamel, and I learned to do decals from Elise, and um, so it's transparent enamel uh, with decals. This is really um, one of my early pieces. 
experiences. I had learned to do cold connections and decided I wanted to mix it up with some enamel. This is a real oh. funky piece mm -hmm. that um, I love the looks on people's faces when they see it. I love um, that piece. You know, I made that in Tom McCarthy's class. It was a found object class. And found this resistor. I think Deb had brought in a bunch of stuff from Gil. And I loved it, so I put it in there. And there's also some gold. This is a framed cuff um, that is roller printed. And this is one of my corrugated pieces. Um, I'm going to be showing some corrugation tomorrow during the demo and uh, with brass bolts. This is the first piece that I was supposed to show you. This is the wire work <laughs> uh, that I did and I learned from Lynn Merchant. This is another cuff, uh, acid etched, pierced. Um, after I did wire work for about four years, I was getting kind of weary and so were my wrists. It's kind of hard on your wrists. And so I signed up for a fabrication class with Deb. And um, this is the first project I made in her class. And I fell in love with rivets and I thought, well, if I put 52 rivets in this cup, I'll really know how to rivet afterwards. And I did. However, I was real chatty Cathy and I loved to talk. And it was taking me forever to make this cup, so I finally decided I can um, talk all I want, but I have to be riveting at the same time, so I finally got it done. This is a recent cup that's framed with Sonora Sunrise stone. And it's actually, I'm missing two of my, my shots that are in that list too. That is really important, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. Uh, the second to the last one was a picture of two students that I have in my studio. And, you know, the, we're making jewelry and other metal formed objects, and there are many avenues you can take with jewelry. And the one that really makes my heart sing, and it's very challenging, and I've learned the most from, is teaching. And the picture that should be up there is of a couple of students. Mm -hmm. The last one is a picture of Deb that I took during one of her classes. I was trying to do it kind of on the sly. And of course, my iPhone has an orange cover on it, so it's a little hard <laughs> And she finally said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just, I'm taking a picture. And she said, well, what for? And I said, well, it's a surprise. Oh. And it's a great picture of Deb in her class teaching her students. And it's a, a picture for me that's an homage to Deb mm -hmm. for all the joy that she's brought awesome. in my life. Mm -hmm. And all the skills, and so thank you. And I wish it was up there. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Gina Lund. She's been doing metals for the last three years as a side project to her glass. Um, she's originally a glass artist, and she loves metals because it has fire involved, and she loves anything that's fire and anything that she can melt. And um, in the future, she plans to spend a little more time doing metals if she can, because right now, um, glass takes over most of her time, but she would love to do metals more. Gina? and um, um, I guess when you just melt the surface of the, of the uh, copper and wire. So that's what this is. It's just a vessel with uh, a piece of my glass and some wire. Very simple. And this is another, a little bit similar. Another piece of glass and some uh, brass and 
that you see that I use are pieces of our large work that either has um, smashed on the ground in the middle of the production of the piece, and I've uh, chosen to cut the pieces all up and uh, put them in a kiln and fuse them to make calves out of them. Um, so some of the designs in the little calves are from the large scale work that we do. Ooh, that's beautiful. This is like a miniature version of, uh, of the large scale work price range of affordability <laughs> for most. And, uh, yeah, these we call the Nautilus series. Um, the one that was two slides before has Marini, which is um, Millefiori is the uh, Italian little flowers that you see on the bottom of paperweights. This one doesn't have the, mil the uh, Marini. This one is just a cane design, netted cane and all done hot and then ground and polished and, and uh, mounted to a base. Okay. Hey. Um, I have uh, the great pleasure to uh, assist Deb Karash in this uh, medals week. Um, Deb uh, comes from Bakersville, North Carolina. Um, she, uh, her mom was an antique dealer and uh, she used to collect antique jewelry. That's how she got started in metals. Um, at about age 30, she took a jewelry class and it inspired her to go, to go back to school and get her bachelor's in metal smithing at uh, Northern, Ar Northern Illinois University. Um, she also went to, uh, for her master's in uh, Northern Illinois University. Um, one of the reasons she says she loves metal is she likes the scale of it. Um, and because uh, it's one of the more intimate art forms that can be seen out in the world uh, on others and by others. Um, she's a full-time studio jeweler and a part-time instructor. And uh, I asked her why she, she likes metals and she feels like metal chose her. So let me, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Deb Koresh. So they're all drawings. This is a brooch, pin pendant. Most of my pieces are pin pendant pieces, so this is as well. And this piece has just a little bit of glass beads up at the top. Um, so I, ma mainly my, my work is um, made from flat sheet and wire. And um, I, t I tend to use a lot of layers in my work. Um, a lot of my work is botanical. And nature, but some of it's geometric. Uh, this piece was inspired by a platter by a, um, an artist whose name is Marty Fielding. And um, my, my, my partner David bought me this platter at a show that we were at. And, and it sat in my studio and I looked at it every day up on the wall in my studio. And, and so one day I just thought, oh, I think I need to make something like that. That's kind of a, a big piece. It's probably like the center flower part is probably three and a half inches across. Um, so there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, not counting the chain, there's six components in that piece that are layered together and riveted together. This has more. This I called a sampler piece. It was it was like my like I was just gonna show everything I could do. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Mike likes to pay attention to the surfaces in here because there's all different textures. And, and uh, it took me, like just all the, once all the parts were finished on that piece, it took me hours to just line up all the rivet holes and get everything put together without scratching anything up. That was a hard piece. And then in the end, I didn't really like it as that necklace, so I took it apart and made it into a giant brooch. <laughs> oh, no. So this is a more, more recent piece. This is from this year. Um, and so on this piece, it's, it's also a pin pendant, but I put the bail in between the layers because I I've been thinking a lot about the division of space. And so I, I wanted to accent that division of space between the <coughs> textures on the top and the textures on the bottom. And I really love pug hats. Mm -hmm. and this is a similar form, but a little different style. It's so much more exciting, giant. <laughs> <laughs> So that piece is, um, is three layers. There's the tulip, and then the background that's green, and then the silver part in the background. Do you color first and then put it together? Or is it no, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, basically what I do is I, I create the copper components, the, the, so the tulip, and then that little middle layer. Um, I make those two pieces, I get them all, I do all my soldering and texturing and soldering and forming and drill all my holes. And then I line everything up, drill the holes through to the silver, and then I take the copper pieces away and I do all the finishing and get those ready to color. And that takes some time. It, 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 things have to sit around for a day or so and develop. And so then I, I do all that, and while I'm waiting for that to happen, then I'm working on the silver back. <laughs> and then after I um, finish that, then I go back and finish all the coloring and put all the finishing on it, and then I rivet it all together. That's kind of the last. It's like the second to the last step, and the last step is to put the pin, <laughs> pin step in. How is the color to that? It's color, it's drawing on metal with colored pencil. And what keeps it from rubbing off? It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> there's, um, there's, a, there's a, about probably four things in the process. It's about a 30 step process to make a piece like that, maybe more. and. Um, about four of those things keep the color adhered. It has to do with texture and the way I apply the color and chemicals and stuff. But the thing is, it's not, you know, it's not about just like putting it on there and then spraying it with something because if it's not already adhered to the metal, it doesn't matter what you spray it with, it's still gonna come off. So it has to be adhered to the metal before you put the finishing touches on it. So this is one of my more recent pieces. I've been doing a lot of things with birds, and uh, so I was kind of excited about this piece. I don't often do really big necklace pieces because they're hard to sell and I have to make a living. <laughs> but um, I was kind of proud of that one, and that one's going to be in the 500 art jewelry necklaces or something like that, one of those 500 books that's coming out, I think, about now. So, um, But there's um, where the beak uh, catches the stem, um, Right there, there's a little, it, it's just kind of a hinge, though, so it, it moves a little bit. And then um, on the far side, that dark uh, leaf with the little dots, those, those are little diamonds. So, I don't use diamonds very often either, but there's something kind of fun about putting diamonds into something that's made with colored pencils. <laughs> yeah. So I've been doing a lot of bird things lately, and I like, I, there's something funny to me about a bird with a mask. So. so I'm a bird with wheels. I have in this in the wintertime I get to go to um, Key West and, and work in the studio of a sculptor there uh, who does uh, these big crazy figurative things with wheels and stuff and so his wheels inspired me to make wheels. student assistant for the night is Susan Bertha, and she um, started taking metal smithing classes with Deb about five or six years ago, and she likes the process and putting things together, um, and in the future she would like to be um, 
a little bit more refined with her work so that she can eventually sell it and make it um, a, a part-time job for her, not necessarily full-time, she said, maybe as a hobby on the side. Susan? Actually, I work as a software database developer, so I'm very right-brained, and I've been taking classes with Deb for five or six years, and I think just in the last year, year and a half, I've started to get a little bit more serious with um, being more comfortable with soldering and really working at the process. This is a box that I made. It looks a little crooked from where I'm standing. And I made this box after I was here two years ago and assisted in a class with Fred Dwight with the art, hinges and articulations. And I wanted to do something with hinges to practice so that I wouldn't forget. And so I decided to make a box. And it was a, a very good learning experience for me because I learned all the things I shouldn't do. <laughs> and so next time it's gonna be much better. But I was quite proud of that box because it actually opened and shut and, you know, it lined up, even though I didn't do it properly. This is a piece that evolved over several semesters in Deb's class. It started as an exercise with exotic wood, and some of you have seen this piece. And I, I didn't quite finish that project that semester, so it evolved into a story bracelet, and somehow I decided to <coughs> incorporate a box class. So it, it, it took me quite a long time to complete this project, but I'm quite proud of it, with, you know, along with Deb's help. Deb was a big inspiration and a lot of help. Uh, oh, I didn't know this was in here. <laughs> this was a, a ring I made early on in Deb's class, probably about five years ago, when we were learning tension setting and riveting. I believe we were learning riveting. And I decided to make a double, you know, triple layer because one layer wasn't quite good enough. And I think that's part of my software mindset. Too complicated. Well, this is another ring I made early on in Deb's class, which I actually wear all the time. You know, it's just recently I started wearing some of my work. Um, this was a, a necklace that I made that was a little more complicated than my ability at the time. And it was inspired by the work of Joanna Goldberg. These are some stack rings that I made recently within the last couple of years. So they're all individual rings just made with pearls. And they sit up high, a little bit high off of the band so that I can stack them together. Well, that's it for me. And now, <laughs> now I have the pleasure of introducing the wonderful teacher that I'm assisting this year. And her name is Nancy Megan Corwin. She is a jeweler a metalsmith, she's a, a teacher and an author. She's recently authored a book on um, Chasing and Repose. She has successfully mixed the traditional and contemporary in, in art metals to create wonderful, what I think are really wonderful, multi-textured layers in metal. And she has received her MBA from the University of Wisconsin, and she has been a teacher in many universities, colleges, and art centers for more than 35 years. So I would love to welcome Megan.
fell in love with it initially, not just the techniques of chasing and repose, which I've done for quite a long time, but just metal smithing, working with silver. When I was taking a class uh, when I was in Florida, I had an undergraduate experience in Florida, with a metal smith who didn't tell us he was a metal smith. I was taking drawing with him, a whole class of drawers. And halfway through the term, he said, you're the worst drawers I've ever seen in my life. I refuse to teach you drawing anymore. And this is, you know, Southern University, and we're thinking, can he do that? And he said, okay, you have a choice now. And he showed us images, slides in those days, of metalwork and images of ceramics. And he said, you can choose, but, you know, we have to go with the majority vote here. You can either learn metals from this point on, or you can learn ceramics. And so, little did we know, it was his own metal work he was showing us. We didn't know that either. And everybody voted for metals. And if it hadn't been for Gary Nofke, I would not be in this business. He handed me a sheet of silver, and it was absolute love at first touch. I don't know how else to explain it. I have never had that experience where something felt so immediately right that I could never give it up, and that was the rest of my life. This is... Um, Chasing and repose, I was introduced to that technique which chasing, for those of you who don't know, refers to tooling the front surface of your piece that you're doing, a sheet of metal, with small tools with specific shapes and purpose, um, doing everything from texturing to outlining to forming. And then repose, or repousse, um, Elise is helping me with this, but I'm not very good at it, uh, being a French word, means to push out or up from the back of the metal usually referring to sheet metal. So this is a bracelet. I learned the technique from Eleanor Modi in graduate school um, in Madison, Wisconsin, who learned it from Satsu Ando, a living treasure of Japan, um, who came around the United States and gave workshops for university professors in the te techniques of chasing and repose because he felt that in Japan, people, students were not interested in a slow technique. Everything had to be fast. So these are very slow techniques. This is a bracelet. It took me weeks to make this. Um, and this is a neck piece, uh, a necklace, and everything that I make takes a long time. Um, the process is meditative, it's very rewarding, and it's an intimate relationship with the material. This neck piece is called the board meeting. And I often have scrap elements all over my desk because I'll make things and they aren't quite right and I just put them on the desk. And I um, had, I was on like three boards, you know, and I was always coming home from a board meeting. And I looked at my desk and there was Fred lying around there and there was Alice and I thought to myself, oh man, it's the board I just came from. So I took all these pieces and put them together and Fred's in the middle with a druzy. <laughs> And Alice is the long one on the right. So I took this to my gallery. It carries my work. And um, I left to have a cup of coffee, you know. And I came back. It was sold. And I said to the gallery director, what's this? You know, nothing ever sells for like five years. What's going on? And she said, well, this woman came in from a board meeting. And she saw the name of your necklace. And she said, oh my god, there's Fred. And there's Alice. So I'm going home with this piece. <laughs> and you can see a close-up. I, I don't only do chasing and repose. I do a lot of different techniques and often incorporate the chasing and repose within those. So there's all different things going on in there. And then this is um, a brooch, which of course looks like a huge piece of sculpture. Isn't it a crack up? But it's only really three inches across. And um, I do a lot of work like this now. I call this my sampler brooch. Based, a whole series is based on sampler quilts. Um, if you know what they are, quilters make a sample block of all these different techniques and they don't relate to each other except that they put them in a grid format so that the quilt has outlining each block maybe a same color band. And that makes you look at the piece as a whole. So I like to separate out the pieces I'm working on into different quadrants or different areas, and I put a texture in that area, and obviously all the textures are different, they don't necessarily go together, but the way that I've arranged them in the radial format around the center gives it a, a construct that allows you to accept all these textures together. This is sterling silver, it's 22 gauge for those of you who are metalsmiths. Um, I like to push the metal as far as possible, and I've learned a lot about how far you can push 22 gauge sterling and still have it um, be strong and wearable. 
I do vessels as well, and this is about 12 inches high. It's a scented oil bottle, so the top is a hairpin. And if you look at the silver part, at the top of the neck, there's a gold part that stops, starts. That's where the hairpin comes out. It pulls the scented oil from the bottle, and then you wear it in your hair. And um, I did a, a lot of those. I really like the whole action of pulling the, the stopper out and then placing it in your hair, like women putting flowers in their hair or putting tiaras on their head, fussing with their hair. This is um, a fish server. And I was lucky enough to be involved uh, with Seymour Rabinovich's um, commissions of fish servers or uh, cake servers. He is a Seattle collector. And he commissioned, he was, he's famous for his knowledge of antique and vintage uh, fish servers and cake servers. And he decided to commission 90, over 90 artists, um, half in the US and half in England, to make their version. He wanted their precise work. And Seymour said to us, at least this is what he said to me, okay, it has to a lot of silver, like a whole lot of silver. And of course, I'm paying you this much, and I'm thinking, I'm going to actually have to, you know, go into debt to make his piece. But he wanted tons of silver. He wanted it really huge. He wanted it to weigh a lot. And he wanted it to be exactly my work, which, you know, those things don't go together, but they did in this piece. So the blade of this piece is 14 gauge sterling, for some of you who know. But that means it's an incredibly heavy piece of silver. And the rest of the elements are all made separately. I made about 20 elements in order to choose the ones that you see here. It's for, um, for serving fish, <laughs> and Seymour's other requirement was that you could do it once. You didn't have to do it more than once, and so once we, we picked up some fish on this. <coughs> it worked for that. Um, the piece is about, I grew up wandering through the woods and picking up uh, seed pods and flowers and stems and tree limbs and, you know, whatever I could get and building these little constructions in the woods. And so this is based on that when you'd wander along by a stream and see all the plant detritus and the leaves and things collecting in the stream. And invariably there was a little pipe somewhere in there and they would all get caught against the pipe and then the water would just continue. So that's what this is based on. This is a brooch and it's very small. <laughs> it's two inches and it's sterling silver with a blue or black pearl. Um, I usually give myself a technical challenge. Satsu Ando taught what's called ushidashi, or top-down technique, where you have a sheet of metal, and in order to make the lowered areas, you hammer from the top. So there's no pushing out from the back. So this is one of my um, practices with that, where all the lower areas that look textured, am I using a texture tool to hammer it down below the top surface? This is a menorah for my son Samuel, and it is um, a flat menorah, and it's made of silver and copper and some brass and a little bit of gold. The center leaf is fold formed and then repassade and chased, and it's impossible without showing you. I can't explain how it's done, but um, I use a lot of fold forming in conjunction with my chasing and repassade. So that's about 22 inches long. Is that really a focus? No. <laughs> Is there any way to focus this? No. Well, you know what? It's over in the gallery, so you know, I'm not even going to tell you about it. Um, oh, that's in focus, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, good. Uh, this piece, I think it's the last piece, is called The Moon and Mankind. So I graduated from high school in 1969. And, um, we also landed on the moon in 1969. And I adore the moon, anything about the moon. I just, I would sit in my backyard in 1969 and gaze at the moon for hours. So this was very important to me. And the woman who runs the gallery where I show my work, Karen Marine, was turning 70. Deb knows this, Koresh. Um, and she was having a show because she wanted to celebrate being 70 called Celebrating 70. And she gave us um, people who were going to be in the show, a choice of a year of her life to do a piece based on that year. And uh, thankfully, I was standing right next to her, so I said, I want 1969. Um, and then found out that 40 of the artists wanted 1969. I had no idea why. Um, so 
I decided to do a piece about the moon landing. And I also decided, again, a technical challenge that that piece, I would chase the elements that would be one inch across. Mm -hmm. So the moon landing is one inch across. Mm -hmm. And the moon is one inch across. And so, because I was working. So I put in a pocket watch, which is about time, past time and future time. And the um, pocket watch opens up and the moon is actually a pendant that lives in there so that you can wear the pocket watch pendant or you can wear the moon pendant or both together, which is the person who owns it, wears them both together. And um, when I did the moon, I'm not sure this is in there, no. Uh, I studied maps of the moon like crazy because I was determined that I would chase the surface of the moon just like the maps. I was going to mm -hmm. follow it as closely as possible. So those craters that you see in there are about as close as you can get to the actual craters on the moon. Mm -hmm. And on the right-hand side is the Sea of Tranquility crater, which I was really careful with. And then the diamond is where they landed. Aww. And that's Aww. my show. Mm -hmm. OK, so now it should be really obvious why Metals Week is so wonderful. Right? Yeah. Thank you all for coming tonight. I really